it for you! Wait a minute. That guy on the grassy knoll's got a gun. He's gonna shoot the president. Holy smokes, I've gotta do something. All right, Lee, time to become an American hero. Proudly present to you the Lone, the Lone Gunman, Gunman Podcast with your host, with your host Rob Clark, Clark, where research comes to shine and myths come to die. Stay tuned, stay tuned. Be, be right, right there. Promises had been made by the administration, by the Kennedy administration, and by the preceding Eisenhower administration that the invasion would proceed under certain circumstances. And uh, when the, that vow was broken, uh, I only interpreted it on the part of Mr. Kennedy as a, a failure of nerve. He was scared because Khrushchev says, don't do this or we're going to do that. You know, so he didn't do it and he deserted the Bay of Pigs. I was involved in the Bay of Pigs. Got a lot of people, who were friends of mine, that were killed in the Bay of Pigs. And I resent that. Don't play political games with me. I'm a military man. I'm a soldier. I go fight. But damn it, if I risk my ass out there and I'm getting shot at, I don't want some stupid ass politician to go ahead and make deals behind my back where my people or maybe myself are going to get killed. I don't like that. After the Bay of Pigs, John F. Kennedy angrily said that he was going to break the CIA into a thousand pieces. I'd like you to respond to that. I think that uh, for him to have said that was uh, uh, probably a way of disguising from himself the fact that he himself was responsible for the fiasco with the Bay of Pigs. And I'm sure that that's something that haunted him for the rest of his days. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 99 of the Lone Gunman Podcast, Neener Neener. Today on the show, I have my buddy Carmine Savastano, author of Two Princes and a King, coming this winter <laughs> to a store or outlet near you. How you doing, Carmine? I'm doing good, Rob. How are you feeling today? I am feeling good. I have got my energy drink beside me, and I am ready to rock, and I'm pissed off. So let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to vent a little bit here real quick, Carmine. Oh, yeah, um, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how many people out there got to listen to the last show since Facebook decided to delete all my posts thanks to some a-hole out there who reported it as spam. Uh, so I'm going to do things a little bit differently from now on. Instead of posting my show in 30 plus Facebook group, JFK groups, if you'd like to listen to my show, I would highly suggest that people out there get the Spreaker app for your smartphone or tablet and, or follow me on Spreaker you know, on the PC and you will be notified as soon as a new show drops. It can't be easier than that. You can also find it on Stitcher, iTunes, subscribe there as well. Um, I've decided that the juice is just not worth the squeeze. I've been, I was banned from posting in, in, in groups for four days. Thanks to, uh, somebody doing this and, you know, just it's just not worth it. If you don't like what I'm saying, if you don't want to listen to the show, if you don't like that I post in 30 groups, block me. Okay? I don't know how to be any more blatant than that. Block me, please. Um, I will be posting the show in a select amount of groups 
on Facebook, but not to the extent that I have been. So if you like the show and you want to follow the show, like I said, I highly recommend uh, that you get the Spreaker app. You'll be notified as soon as the show drops. Or you can follow the Lone Gunman Podcast Facebook page, which I would also recommend you do. Um, I will p- be posting the show there. And I just created a new group on Facebook called JFK uh, Assassination Show Topics. So this group is going to be limited to 200 people at a time. If you'd like to join up, just search for it and uh, and get in there. And we're basically going to be discussing um, any podcast or radio shows related to uh, the Kennedy assassination, you know, and I, I'm talking anything from from this show, Doug's show, Chuck's show, Black Op Radio, Brent Holland's show, um, Alan Dale's show, Popeye's show, any anything JFK related, any 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 authors that get on mainstream media and happen to be able to do a show, um, we're going to be discussing that there. And if you'd like to have topics discussed on this show or guest suggestions. You can do that there as well. Once again, that is JFK Show Topic Discussions if you'd like to join. It is a closed group. You cannot see what's going on in there unless you join. So feel free to join up with that. And like I said, follow the, the Lone Gunman Podcast on Facebook and also Neopolis Media Group. You can follow them on Facebook and Twitter as well. Okay, Carmine, I'm done venting. I've just brought. You, well, you mind if I add a little something onto the end of that? Sure, please do. <laughs> um, I want to say too that all of Rob's stuff will also be available on Neapolis Media Group's websites, so you'll always be able to get it there. It'll be on Neapolis Media Group's Facebook page, and unfortunately, I had to go through the same thing that Rob went through. And as where Rob is being nice and deciding to just limit his posts on Facebook to those he thinks you know will pay attention and not have a problem with it. I went on a blocking spree. <laughs> so I largely don't have to deal with a lot of the people that are probably trying to cause you these problems. And I think that it's disgusting what they're doing because it has a chilling effect on everything. And, you know, you see people just spamming real spam, you know, just junk ideas about JFK with no evidence in these groups day after day. You know, we all know who they are. It's the same people. They just keep putting up the worst ideas over and over. And none of us ever complain. We let them say they're tripe. We let them claim the what isn't proven, and we move on. But they're actively targeting good posts, interviews, discussion, you know, rational use of evidence, because what we're taking up too much space between their plethora of junk. You know, it's 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 disgusting. Yeah, you know, if yeah. you're gonna yeah, go do your thing and try not to mess with other people. And, you know, we all have our ways of dealing with it, but we're going to keep putting out our stuff. This isn't going to stop Rob. It's not going to stop me or anyone else that wants to actually get towards the truth. No, no. And I'll, and I'll say, you know, that's the, this is like the pettiest form of bullshit that I've ever encountered. Because out of all the people, and I'm talking to you, people I freaking hate, you know, like Ralph Sinkay, Richard Hook, you know, and, and all these guys. I've never once reported any of their links for spam or, or anything like that, because that's just juvenile, petty crap. You know what I mean? If I don't want to yeah. see their stuff, I block them. And believe me, I've blocked many, many of them, including the ones I've mentioned with Fetzer. I mean, I've mentioned all the stuff that I don't even want to see. Richard Sharnan, I don't. I blocked them all because mm-hmm. I I got no time for them. You know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna interrupt what they're trying to do. You know, so I just block them. You know, I'm not going to report yeah. it for spam. That's just pettiness. That's straight pettiness. And, you know, I do this show to start a discussion, and I post it in JFK groups so that people interested in the assassination will see that, hey, here's a guy who cares about doing, you know, a podcast about different aspects of the Kennedy assassination for everybody to listen to for free, you know. And, you know, you want to report it as spam. That's just – that's just petty. I mean, I don't know what else to call it. Yeah. So, well, I, I also think it shows that their ideas are weak because if they believed in the strength of their ideas, they could present them and let them stand on their own like we do. If yeah. you don't think your ideas are strong enough, then maybe get some new ideas. But attacking credible ideas and attacking evidence is not going to bring us any closer. It, it seems like they don't want the truth. They want their narrative to be considered true. 
Right. And I've also forgot, I'll, I'll still be posting the show on TLGpodcast.com. So you can also check it out there. And the show I did was on the tramps, which I know is a highly contested area uh, for, for people who have certain beliefs uh, of who these guys were. And, uh, you know, I know anytime you post anything about the tramps, you're going to get a heated discussion. You're going to get people that believe that they're hunting Sturgis. You're going to get people believe that they're Harrelson and Holt or, or, you know, Harrelson and Hunt or, you know, any other combination of these, of these people, uh, that you can, you can think of. And, you know, because it fits their theory uh, of things and, and this is what they choose to believe, which is fine. If they want to believe it, that's fine. Uh, I, I choose to believe what the evidence tells us, which is, you know, we have three arrest reports for these guys. Uh, I've seen the, the three guys in real life and, and compare their photos. And to me, it looks like them. And to me, it doesn't look like Holt, Harrelson, Hunt, Sturgis, uh, Rogers, Mont, you know, David Christ or whoever else was alleged to be these tramps. Um, but anyway, enough said about that this week, me and Carmine are going to get into more about debunking Howard Hunt, E. Howard Hunt and Frank Sturgis, not only not being the tramps, but even being anywhere near Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. And we got some good evidence and documents to back it up. So, Carmine, kick it off, my brother. Okay. Well, I thought we might start with Mr. Sturgis's testimony. Okay. Uh, Sturgis testified to the Rockefeller Commission, and the file comes from the Church Committee box files. And, you know, I'll just say exactly what was said. Were you in Dallas at any time in November 1963? Sturgis states, I don't recall, sir, but I do know one thing. I was not in Dallas in November. I believe it was November 22nd when President Kennedy was assassinated. Where were you on that day? I was home in Miami. Were you literally at home or were you at work? I remember, sir, I saw the assassination on about the president on television. Now, of course, it's been taped on television, so it could have been seen any time during that day. Yes, sir. So what basically Sturgis is telling us, and it comes with – you know, it, it is up to the listener to determine whether or not they trust the corroboration. But Sturgis is stating to the commit to the Rockefeller Commission that he was in Miami with his family that day. You know, he was involved in multiple anti-Castro activities. He was never pr- pr- a proven direct employee of the CIA, though he might have received some pay. Right. Um, he uh, Sturgis was repeatedly in contact with people involved in agency-funded operations. You know, he never uh, was employed by the agency itself, though that we can prove. But Sturgis was confirmed to have association with Cuban Air Force leader Pedro Diaz Lanz, and he did inform the agency on some of Lanz's, the Lanz, Diaz, Diaz Lanz brothers' activities. So he attempted to enrich himself, and he sometimes used agency-funded programs to aid his illegal financial arrangements, you know, shipping illegal arms, fraudulent pretenses to collect sponsorship funds, and illegally selling aircraft. Yeah, which I was going to say, you know, he likely did for money. <laughs> yeah. Um, information for money. And mm-hmm. this is before – I believe the Rockefeller Committee was before uh, Marita Lorenz came out with her story. Uh, Mm -hmm. I guess I guess she told HSCA this when we first started hearing about, uh, you know, this 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 car trip to Dallas, you know, with Sturgis involved and E. Howard Hunt involved, um, I believe because. Yeah, yeah, no, it was uh, a lot of, yeah, just disparate different tales tried to be woven into the, the Lorenz story, stuff that had, you know, existed separately before. Yeah, but she specifically fingered E. Howard Hunt, Eduardo, oh, yeah. and Frank Sturgis as, as being in Dallas on November 22nd. Um, mm-hmm. And, of course, this was, you know, resulted in the in the big trial, the Spotlight trial, um, you know, with Mark Lane representing the Spotlight and – uh yeah, whether or not it was – yeah, it was reasonable to state that they had been involved in the assassination of the president. Right. Yeah, I think a lot of people get confused about that too because Lane didn't prove that they were involved. Lane proved it was not unreasonable to think they were involved, and those are very different things. I think a lot of people take that trial as proving that they were part of the assassination. It didn't prove that. It just proved that they had both been involved in so many illegal activities. It was not unreasonable to claim, as the spotlight did, that they were involved. Right, and I think a lot of, of what people what, – what, what puts these guys in Dallas in people's minds 
is their involvement in Watergate together. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, being tied to CIA and everybody thinking that Watergate has something to do, to do with the Kennedy assassination and what they were up to there. I think a lot of that, you know, it kind of makes sense to some people. And they, and they try to relate it all the way back to 1963 as these guys actually being involved and being there. Yeah. Well, I think, too, the Bay of Pigs, because they were both involved in, in you know, like Hunt was actually involved in some of the planning and that and Sturgis was involved in anti-Castro activities. So I think that they automatically assume it was just a big, long thing that they associated all the way from before. Because uh, Sturgis lost his citizenship um, because of his employment by the Castro government in 59. So, And then he had a dispute with Raul Castro, and then he was fired by the Castro regime. So he fled, to Cu- he fled Cuba, and he went back to Miami in July 59 and formed the International Anti-Communist Brigade later. Right, and, you know, and I see, you know, I mean... Look, Sturgis was a legitimate badass, you know what I mean? Like yeah, killer, yeah, you know, he yeah. was. And now this is in contrast to what we what we know about E. Howard Hunt. Um, you know, mm-hmm. this guy is a pencil pusher. He's an organizer. He's a, you know, he's an author. I mean, he's he, he's yeah, not he's not he's not out there being James Bond and shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's not he's not and he's not that important at the time in the agency. You know, Hunt was. You, you know, feasibly a much more seasoned and, you know, informed man during Watergate than he had ever been in 1963. In 1963, he wasn't that powerful in the agency. So he wouldn't have, even let's say there had been a rogue cell or a rogue person in the agency that were to use people, they wouldn't have used Sturgis because he had been arrested multiple times and he was a known figure associated with all these acts. And they wouldn't have used Hunt because. Hunt once again was known with the f- failed Bay of Pigs, you know, the failed Bay of Pigs program, plus all of the other things that had not gone according to agency plan that Hunt was involved with. He wasn't some great agent as he, you know, appeared later in the seventies. Right, and I mean, we should say too that I believe I, I believe that E. Howard Hunt wasn't even with the CIA during Watergate, was he? Uh, or not officially. Hunt, no, no, yeah, he wasn't officially with them, but he still was giving information back to them. Right. Yeah, that's what allowed him to be uh, employed at you know at, at the White House by Richard Nixon as his mm-hmm. as his what was his name or his title? Uh, I can't remember the title. I remember it was the Dirty Tricks. Uh, you know, they called themselves the Plumbers. They called themselves the Dirty Tricks Squad. Right. Yeah, he yeah. was basically you know Richard Nixon's secret weapon. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, you know the guy that yeah. kept him abreast of, of you know intelligence things and uh, also got things done for him on a seedier level. Yeah, and Sturgis, like you said, was a totally different type of person. You know, Sturgis, uh, he was arrested for smuggling for violations of air navigation rules in '61. Um, he got arrested in 1962 in Sombrero Key, Florida, and charges of violating U.S. neutrality laws because he tried to form an expedition to invade a foreign country. Uh, he attempted to sell aircraft to the Cuban exiles for raids against Cuba in September 63. Yeah, and I guess we should say, too, that there's also an allegation out there by a, a former New York detective, I think it's Jim Rothstein, that he claims that, that Frank Sturgis admitted to him that, that he's the one that shot Kennedy. Um, of course, this is just a story, uh, a claim with no evidence whatsoever to back it up. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, and, and he was not only did he keep getting arrested, Sturgis also, you know, just was on the number of failed plots. You know, just, just the Bay, the Bay of Pigs would just be the beginning of a failed career as far as accomplishing what he ultimately wanted to do, which was take out Castro. So, you know, I mean, and make money. Yeah, and and look, towards the end of his life, you know, in in the in the late eighties and nineties, <clears throat> you know, when he was interviewed, he. You know, Sturgis was proclaiming that the Russians were were behind the assassination. You know, he wasn't out there saying, "Hey, I'm the one that killed him." You know, so what, whatever he supposedly said to this Rothstein guy is just a story. Well, you know, it could have been made up by Rothstein. It could have been Sturgis boasting and you know attributing something to himself that that um, just to make himself look bigger and better and badder. You know, who knows? But. You know, it didn't follow and jive with what he was saying towards towards the end of his life. Yeah, his story definitely evolved. And, you know, 
we, he prior testified to the Rockefeller Commission that he and his family were in the at home Miami on November twenty second, sixty three. You know, he allowed the commission to obtain twenty over twenty pictures of him for comparison with the photographic evidence in Dealey Plaza. He testified that he's not one of the men arrested and photographed in Dallas that day. He also said that he would submit for a polygraph test to officials on any of this, and he was willing to be polygraphed on all public assertions of being involved in the assassination of JFK, MLK, and RFK. Because some people said that he was responsible for MLK and RFK, too. Right. Yeah, which is, I mean, it's just insane. Yeah, no, there's, and and once again, I mean, if he wasn't even connected enough, you know, by the evidence and by our estimation to be with the JFK, there's no way he was connected to the other two assassinations. That's just people getting lazy and they have an, a familiar name that kind of fits the bill of an assassin. So let's just use his name again. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, he, just from seeing his interviews and everything, you know, he was a smug bastard. He, uh, I mean, he was, he was legit and he knew it, you know, and did he embellish things to make himself seem more legit? Probably, you know anybody would have and a lot of people have over the years um of course as as we can tell by how many suspects we have is to proclaim themselves to be the assassin of the president you know mhm yeah no there's there's never a shortage of people who want to take credit for doing it <laughs> no but they don't have the evidence to prove <laughs> any of what they say <laughs> no no, and and you'll still hear today that this Jim Rothstein thing is is bandied about as 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 you know hard evidence, but by, by people such as Fetzer even to this very day. So you know it doesn't end; it just doesn't end. Yeah. Well, you know, all we can do is you know, like we were talking about earlier, is we can give the evidence, we can try to be reasonable, consider both sides of every you know issue, and then render some sort of opinion. You know, that's based on evidence, not you know as Fetzer and others might based on speculation or based on whatever narrative they're trying to push at the time. Right. Yeah. Now, so we have Sturgis basically telling the, the Rockefeller commission and answering their questions. And he blatantly said, that, look, that's not me. I wasn't arrested. I'll take a polygraph. You yeah. Know, on any question you, you have. Yeah. So I, I think that, and to me, that's the most honest, the most honest answer usually anyway is the initial one. So initially when Sturgis realized that he might actually get fingered, he got nervous. He realized that people were actually trying to place him in there as the killer of the president, and he might be facing the rest of his life in jail if people are allowed to just speculate him into the clink. So he decided that he would just be totally upfront and open. It's later on, kind of like with Hunt, these other stories develop and he embraces them because he knows that they're not true. He knows he'll never actually be punished because he wasn't there. Yeah, and this is after the HSCA, and <clears throat> you know when, when when you got the War Commission not finding out, you know who was behind it, and you got the HSCA investigating things and not finding out who's behind it, then it leaves the door wide open for these guys like Sturgis to come out and say, "Yeah, it was me," you know, to somebody. Uh, yeah, because they know no one will ever take them, you know, to court and try to prove it. Exactly. Exactly. So let's let's take a look at. Uh, Edu uh, Eduardo. Okay, uh, Hunt. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure we got everything. Yeah, so, yeah, I think we, we did a pretty bang-up job on Sturgis. The two witnesses, by the way, would be his nephew and his wife. He said his mother-in-law was there, but during the time of the Rockefeller Commission, she had passed away. So it wouldn't be three witnesses on Sturgis. Gotcha. And, you know, everybody's willing to say, well, they were his family. You know, of course they would lie for him. But the Rockefeller Commission had the ability to subpoena them and had the ability to charge Sturgis with perjury. And some official co uh, committees had done so to CIA members and non-CIA connected people as well. So Sturgis uh, wanted to save his skin and realized that he had to be honest at least with them. It was only later he decided to come up with all these ideas. And, oh, the final thing on Sturgis, um, that one of the documents I sent you uh, – there was no need to use Sturgis because he himself acted to advance agency goals without their guiding. He would just give them information. They didn't have to make him a direct employee to use him. And uh, there is, however, here's the proviso on all of that. I, you know, I totally support what the evidence supports that Sturgis was not in Dallas on the 22nd. I support that. He likely did not, was a direct employee for the CIA, but in a memo from agency director, uh, James R. Schle former agency director, James R. Schlesinger, he quoted former agency director, William Colby, 
and Colby had stated in a private meeting that Sturgis has not been on the payroll for a number of years. Now, this would suggest, in my estimation, that the agency may have actually paid Sturgis for his informant reports and for undertaking some of the prior anti-Castro activities. Yet no evidence suggests he was part of the Kennedy assassination. You know, his well-known face, his arrest record would compromise him and not allow him to escape without notice. The agency likely would never directly utilize such an untrustworthy, talkative man with repeated arrests to undertake a covert assassination. Right, and I don't think somebody of his ilk would have went so quietly <laughs> uh, march marching over to the police department. You know what I mean? Exactly. I just don't see it, you know, and plus, you know, not to mention that, but I mean, you also have supposedly an honest to God CIA agent. You have an honest to God CIA or, or well, supposedly a CIA contract agent. And mm -hmm. then you have basically a cold blooded killer with no agency yeah. ties whatsoever being alleged to be these trio of guys working together you know, I just don't buy that either. Either they're all going to be part of the CIA. They're all going to be mercenary. You know, it just doesn't make sense for them to all three have these different diverse backgrounds and, and ties to different things. Yeah. Well, and the biggest hole, I think, in both of their backgrounds is no connection whatsoever to any assassination plot directly. You know, it would be the people who organized assassination plots who feasibly could – one of those people could be someone who could organize an outside or rogue element assassination plot. They wouldn't need men like Sturgis and they wouldn't need you know men like Hunt because neither one of them were ever included in any of the agency assassination schemes. You know, It was other exiles and some other leaders of the agency that had organized those things. They would have a firsthand knowledge. To me, that would be the people or people that are directly connected to them, but not these two, as you said, disparate fellows – who chances are would have not mingled much, especially not yeah. enough to know how to undertake this with just them and a few people. Yeah, they'd be like, okay, guys, they got us. I guess we'll just give up and walk on over to the police station. Uh, you yeah. know. I, yeah, you know. exactly. They didn't fight, really? Oswald fought. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, Everybody, it, you know, innocent or guilty, sometimes you still fight. <laughs> yeah, and even if we're talking about, you know, Holton Harrelson, these – you know, these guys supposedly are, are killers. They're just going to go quietly, and yet they all supposedly had weapons on them. You know, it's just – it's it's ludicrous. But to get back to Hunt for a second. Yeah. Okay, Marita Lorenz identified him as, as, as this guy named Eduardo who was what they called the paymaster who was handing money out at this, at this meeting um, the night before the assassination. And, you know, if if by some chance – her story is correct, and you know this this event took place. I just don't see E. Howard Hunt, author, pencil pusher, organizer, paymaster, being in Dealey Plaza with the shooters. Um, that's just to me. I would be as far away from Dealey Plaza as I can get. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. I think that, that that applies for a lot of famous people that some would speculate were in the plaza, and there's no evidence for that. You don't want to be at the crime scene when the crime goes down. No, you want to be as far away from it as possible. Mm -hmm. But now the Hunt allegations, like I said, it is, 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 was as paymaster. Now, of course, more allegations stem from a book called Coup d'etat in America – by Michael Canfield and Alan J. Weberman, who mm -hmm. fingered these two as being tramps in Dealey Plaza. They even had these um, plastic vellum overlays in their book to prove it, you know, and uh, and whatnot. But that book added a lot of fuel to the fire, and uh, I think a lot of it was was dead wrong. I yeah. mean, it can it convinced. St. John Hunt, E. Howard Hunt's son, to believe that his dad was a tramp uh, for for many, many years. I think he has since rescinded that and seen the light um, on, on that allegation. And he, I don't believe he asserts that anymore. Um, 
But, you know, we have E. Howard Hunt's famous deathbed confession, okay, which is if it's to be to believed, you know, he said in there that he was just a bench warmer, a, uh, you know, not a, not a player. So, I mean, even he himself didn't put himself in Dealey Plaza as a tramp. He never admitted that, and neither did Sturgis. No, no, neither one of the men admitted that. And, you know, we should also consider that after Hunt recovered, it, it ended up not being his deathbed. He omits that conversation for the rest of his life. You know, he never tries to retell the story again where he puts all these people in. Another question would be, how would he even know? He wasn't privy to any of the assassination plots, and if he was a bench warmer, there's no need to tell him. He wouldn't have been involved. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to involve an extra person for no reason. Anyone could have done the things that E. Howard Hunt did without the name attachment and the chance of discovery. Yeah, I mean, because he was, he was pretty well known at the time, but... I mean, he was a you know famous author. Well, not famous, but he was an author. Um, you know, he wrote spy novels, and it, you know, it wasn't like nobody knew who he was. And you know, you have you have his 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 death supposed deathbed confession. Um, you know, chock full of CIA assets and agents. And, and LBJ. Yeah, you know, he kind of just tied all of the speculation together in one big tale. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the last time that, you know, the CIA took orders from, from a president. Uh, they sure as hell didn't listen to John Kennedy. Why would they listen <laughs> Why would they listen to uh, uh, LBJ? I mean, they didn't listen to Eisenhower either. He warned us about him. Um, you know, but all of a sudden, LBJ, is, he's got enough swag to tell the CIA what to do and, and to kill a president, and, and they just go ahead and listen to him? Yeah, no, it's, I think, once again, just muddying the waters. It's, you know, Hunt was just muddying the already blackened waters of the case. Oh, you most know, definitely. He, yeah, and that's that, that was kind of his job. He was into misinformation. That's kind of his whole CIA bag was covert operations using deception. So I have no reason to think that he would not be doing the same thing by putting out this fake story about him possibly being involved when there's no evidence of him being involved. Yeah. And people forget too, you know, at, at the time that he was dying, I mean, he hadn't been employed by the CIA for, you know, 20 plus years, 30 years. And I don't think his books were selling that good. I mean, it wasn't like E. Howard Hunt was rolling in money towards the end of his life. And, you know, the, uh, the hardships of his son are, are well known and are out there. Um, you know, was this, was this a last ditch effort, you know, to maybe supply some possible income for his son after his death, you know, because yeah. a lot of these guys, like I said before, you know, they realize that nobody will ever be able to solve this or at least with the available evidence, um, you know, as far as who did it, you know, or who, who pulled the trigger. Who was behind it, you know? So these allegations are a way for people to make money. And we see it, you know, with people like Judy Baker and, and people like James Files. They want to put themselves into the story to either make themselves infamous or notorious or to sell books, you know? And what happened? St. John Hunt wrote a book about his father's deathbed confession. There you have it. Yeah. And to me, that's a much more reasonable explanation based on the evidence that we have rather than just assuming that anyone – and it, you know, it's, it applies to anyone who has anything to say about the case. If they don't have the evidence to prove what they're saying, then it's just speculation. No matter how you know, enchanting speculation might be, <laughs> it yeah. still isn't the goods. You need the evidence if you want to prove it. And uh, do you mind if I uh, – basically on Hunt – and a lot of people doubted because originally when Hunt was questioned, he said that he uh, was in Washington, D.C., and which is likely true, just not where he said he was. He said he was in Washington, D.C., and he said he was with his wife, that they were shopping, at a, uh, out shopping. They had gone to a Chinese food store to get some Chinese. They had prior lived in Asia, so they you know, liked that type of food. Now, 
that sounds like a pretty thin story. Yeah, well, I think he had a cover job too at like an advertising agency, mm-hmm. <clears throat> which he, I think he, you know, he said he was working at as well that day. Yeah. Yeah. So what ended up happening from some of the evidence that I was able to find was uh, during an interview with Richard Sprague, um, Hunt, it was confirmed that Hunt, Richard Helms, the DDP at the time, uh, or uh, the uh, deputy director of plans. Yeah. But the big uh, wig, you know. Yes. Uh, CIA Inspector General Lyman Kirkpatrick and a Cuban exile named Enrique Harry Ruiz Williams were together on November 22nd, 1963, and they were planning to undertake a CIA backing of Cuban invasion troops training in the Florida Keys. Huh. Now, that seems go. like something he was doing. Yeah, exactly. I think that the it was a cover story. I think that the story about him driving around to the Chinese, Chinese uh, food store with his wife was a cover story, but it was to cover a meeting he was having with CIA officers and a Cuban exile. Exactly. And, you know, because he, he is – he's talking to Richard Helms and Kirkpatrick, you know, and they're, they're talking about, you know, possibly planning, you know, anti-Castro, you know, activities. Yeah, yeah. They want to train troops in the Florida Keys to go invade Cuba despite what the president has already stopped all that. Yeah, which we know did happen, you know, mm-hmm. as evidenced by, you know, people like Jerry Hemming who was, you know, heavily involved in the – in the Florida Keys, like No Name Key, and and all these Cuban raiders and mercenaries down there that was more than eager to uh, hop on some gunboats and and head for Cuba, you know? Yeah. And uh, I think another important part of this is that Helms, we do know that Helms was later convicted of perjury, so he's not the greatest source, but I think he had enough self-preservation that he would not put himself anywhere near Hunt that day if he thought Hunt had anything to do with the assassination. Same with Kirkpatrick. These are, you know, he's the inspector general of the CIA. He's supposed to be the guy who checks on everybody. So he's not going to allow himself to be placed with Hunt that day if he thinks Hunt has any impropriety. <laughs> yeah, and let me also reiterate this fact, that if the CIA was involved in the, in the assassination of Kennedy, okay, there would have been people like Bill Harvey um, involved there would have been people like, uh, oh, what's the guy's name? It's escaping me. Morales. J.C. King. Morales. Yep. yep. It would have been. It would have been these guys. Um, and they wouldn't have been anywhere, yeah, near the location. They might have set it up, but it would be people that they could kill off easily afterwards or disappear out of the country. Yeah, they that would, would be shooters, not guys like Sturgis. Yeah, or Hunt. I mean, that's my point. Is Hunt? This wasn't his bag of tricks, you know. This wasn't his specialty. They wouldn't, the CIA wouldn't have enlisted Hunt to oversee the assassination on site. I mean, that's just patently ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I totally agree with that. You know, they would have never risked being with Hunt, the, you know, the people that are identified to be with Hunt the day of the assassination in D.C. And Hunt was responsible for repeated failed operations. He was unimportant in the agency hierarchy in 63. And he has no connection to the established assassination plots where other CIA officers, one of them, you know, perhaps acting in a rogue manner or outside of the CIA charter, could have been involved. That would make a lot more sense. But there's no evidence to suggest, you know, that Hunt or Sturgis would have been involved. Right. And, you know, like what he told Sprague, um, you know, about having this meeting, you know, Stuff stuff that the CIA does is not supposed to be public knowledge. It's it's supposed to be kept quiet. It's supposed to be kept, kept behind locked doors. The public is not supposed to know about what they're doing. Yeah. And it, it's it's not just for, you know, it, I mean, it's clandestine service. It, it's 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 supposed to be not public knowledge what they're doing, which is you know why he's reluctant to talk about it in public, um, even yeah. if it's something as innocuous as having a meeting with Helms in DC, um, he's not supposed to talk about that, you know, so he makes up a cover story, you know, with the, with the Chinese food and the, and the ad agency and, you know, whatever, whatever. Yeah, no. And I I think that it, you know, it, it also is telling that we have internal documents, like another one of the documents that I sent, um, was an internal memo that revealed that the CIA did a review of E. Howard Hunt's whereabouts on the 22nd and that, uh, agency officer S.D. Breckenridge, who is one of my favorites because of some of the 
the in, insults he's, he lobbed at the HSCA and other internal memos, but that's another story. <laughs> uh, he contacted the Office of Security and he reviewed related files on Hunt, which all checked out. Then he contacted the off, one of the files that Rob's going to be putting out is, is, Hunt, is uh, Sturgis's Office of Security file, so you can actually look through it. And with Hunt, they'd contacted uh, the Office of Security and then the Office of Finance, and they asked Hunt for information. They checked the four-week period ending on the 23rd, November 23rd, 1963, and Hunt was noted to have taken 11 hours of sick leave and no annual leave, which is what messes up his Chinese food story because he said he would have been on leave. He wouldn't have been on leave. Right. Yeah, and they, they have no exact – they don't really know exactly when he did take that leave if it was, you know – November twenty second or or not? We're we're talking about a like a three month period, I think here, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was eleven yeah hours. They said he didn't take any big increment, which too would preclude him being able to travel. And then they did internal review of his travel records, and it stated he had undertook no travel during November sixty three. So he did not leave the DC area. No, and there you know there'd be records of that. And I mean, of course, he could have traveled under a false name or whatever. But it, he it is possible. Yeah, but he would have had to be gone for more than eleven hours. <laughs> yeah, for you know, at least at least, you know, if he was there the night before, because that's the allegation, he had to get there sometime the day before, and he obviously at least twenty four hours, if not more. Exactly, and there's no record of that. All the records the agency has, and these are internal records. You know, people can say that well, they faked all the records. First of all, there was no reason to because they never thought we'd see them. They were internal files that were supposed to remain classified. Right, you know, and, and these were these were rumors at the time. Of course, Watergate didn't help things, but you know that the HSCA did try to look into and clear up. And and at least according from the documents, it appears to me that that it's quite evident that that, that they did. Yeah, yeah, something, and it's unfortunate. Like we were talking about earlier, just the chilling effect of people who are speculating with no evidence, just repeatedly saying it over and over these decades. That is what is hurting a lot of the inquiry in this case is that we have people that are actually muddying the waters worse than they were when we first got to look at the evidence because they don't want to believe what the evidence states. Exactly. Which, you know, leads us to where we are now. We got, you know, we got a mess. We got to try and figure out here and, and do a little debunking to, um, to actually figure out who these guys were in, in, in Dallas, you know, that the garrison made such a big deal of, um, because we weren't told about them and, and whose arrest records we didn't have until the late 80s when we finally got all of, um, I think it was, was it Alexander or Wade's files released? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so obviously the, the Dallas Police Department had turned over these arrest files from that day to the, to the district attorney and they, they didn't have them in their files anymore. But when we got Henry Wade or Alexander's um, files, Lo and behold, here they are, you know, plus other ones. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I I think another thing, too, is that, you know, additional people need to realize there's always going to be new evidence as declassification occurs and as new things are found. There's going to be new evidence. So our ideas have to be able to evolve with the new evidence. We can't just the problem I see with some people is that they stake their claim and that's it. They'll never change their mind, no matter how much evidence and that's ridiculous. You know, you have to you, – you, if you want to know the truth, if you want to know what the evidence actually infers, you have to be willing to change your opinion when new evidence comes forward that's credible. Exactly. And hopefully we've changed the minds today and, and let people see, you know, yes, E. Howard Hunt was a CIA agent. Yes, he was involved in – clandestine operations both when he was with the CIA and both when he was with in the in the Nixon White House and I think the association with with Hunt and Sturgis at Watergate really fuels and and did fuel these these rumors of them being in Dallas and associated with the Kennedy assassination not to mention the coup d'etat in America book who really put it out there for people to to kind of see and buy into because, you know, granted, I mean, it's, it's not night and day that these people obviously are not the tramps. I mean, there is a viable, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? A viable 
you know, comparison to be made here that they uh-huh. do kind of look like these guys. Okay. But like I said in the last episode, kind of don't cut it. Okay. Ex- exactly. <laughs> Close, but no cigar. You know, the, the, the problem is too, is that, you know, people talk, a, a lot of people are making it from second, third hand copies of pictures, often blurry you know, often altered in some cases because they face alteration by various people over the years. So you don't know exactly the, uh, you know, the authenticity of the image you're looking at. Then add in the fact that the House Select Committee did an extended photographic analysis and Hunt and Sturgis do not match. There's too many disparate parts of their faces that don't match the tramps. So, you know, it, a lot of this stuff that we have discussed, unfortunately, was largely decided by the evidence decades ago but because we have people that won't accept it, we have to debunk it, you know, and bring new evidence to further show you that it's just not the case. You know, you, it's kind of like the whole LBJ thing. Yes, Lyndon Baines Johnson was dishonest. Yes, he was a villain in some cases, and he did things that were unethical. But that alone, just because somebody's a bad person or a villain, doesn't mean they're responsible for the JFK assassination. No, and and like you said, people are still spurting out that. Oh yeah, it's definitely it's definitely E. Howard Hunt and Sturgis. I mean, look at the pictures. It's obviously them. Sometimes on a daily basis, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the, those arrest reports are fake. You know that's why they didn't have them for thirty years. They just made them. You know, and <laughs> yeah, which is ridiculous because we didn't have a ton of the information we have. You know, I I know a lot of people are looking forward to two thousand seventeen, and I hope we do get some interesting files if they do release them. But there are millions of files that are still unread that were released in the 90s by the AARRB. And I think that there's a lot of great information in there that we can still find. We don't have to wait to start looking. Yeah, and I just want to read real quick uh, from uh, E. Howard Hunt's HSCA testimony where he was asked specifically about this. And he says – In due course, a tabloid called the National Tattler, (laughs) sometime around March 74, I believe, published a story implying that I had been in Dallas when Kennedy was killed and had a hand in the assassination. In response, I sued the tabloid, which promptly went out of business and left me with a default judgment and additional legal costs. In March 74, four years ago, I discussed a variety of accusations with the Rockefeller Commission. Although my testimony was not desired, I provided the commission with the following sworn affidavit. I, E. Howard Hunt, affirm the following to be my recollections of my whereabouts on November 22, 1963. On that date, I was an employee of the Central Intelligence Agency assigned to the Domestic Operations Division, located in a commercial building in Washington, D.C. I was driving with my late wife on 8th Street near 8th or 9th Street when we first heard of the Kennedy shooting on our car radio. We had been purchasing Chinese groceries at a store named, as well as I can recall it, Wa Ling. <laughs> I do not know how long after the initial radio reports were made that my wife and I first heard the news. Brinkley was a common commentator I remember because of his having theorized a right-wing plot. Hmm. I.e. Dallas citizens had abused Adlai Stevenson and the climate of Dallas extremism had caused Kennedy's shooting. From the Chinese grocery store, we drove out to Wisconsin Avenue to pick up our daughter, Kavan, from Sidwell Friends School. On joining us, my daughter told us what we already knew, that President Kennedy had been shot. She had learned this because two of Robert Kennedy's children had been taken from Sidwell Friends School, presumably by Secret Service agents. From Kavan's school, we drove correctly, uh, directly to our home on Bolton Road in Sumner, Maryland, off Massachusetts Avenue, extended. At home was my newly born son, David a maid, Mary Trainer, and my wife's aunt, the late Leona Drexler of Chicago, our elder son, St. John, a student at nearby Brookmont Elementary School, was probably already at home. As I recall, our oldest child, Lisa, arrived soon afterward by bus from Ursuline Academy and joined us at the television set in our basement recreation room where we stayed long hours watching the unfolding of events, the swearing-in of LBJ, and the arrival at Andrews Field of the presidential coffin, etc. As to why I was not at my office that entire afternoon, one can only presume that I had left early to help my wife shop for the planned Chinese dinner in preparation of which I normally assisted. Now, I will say this, Carmine, it's possible 
that he actually did both. He could have met with Helms that morning. I, I agree with you. I, uh, yeah, no, I, I would totally agree. It's possible he did both and he just decided to omit the real you know, thing he had done that day, which was the meeting with Helms and Kirkpatrick. Right. I think that's what happened because he says there that I was not at my office that entire afternoon. Okay. And that's, yeah, that's probably where the meeting, yeah. No, I think that, that that's probably the most feasible, feasible idea. Is right. that, yeah, he probably did both. And that way he didn't have to lie, even though he wasn't away lying. Yeah. And he, and he goes on to say here, I did not meet Frank Sturgis until the spring of 1972, the introduction being performed by and at the office of Bernard Barker. I never at any time met or knew Lee Harvey Oswald, Jack Ruby, or any other person involved in the Dallas slings. I was not in Mexico in 1963. In fact, I was not in Mexico between the years 61 and 70 and have not been there since a weekend pleasure trip to Acapulco in July of 1970. I have no diaries or memorabilia prior to 69, having destroyed as many outdated files and records as possible to save weight in the move to my Florida home in July of 74. I retained only such records, bank statements, etc., as are required by the five-year International Revenue Service or Internal Revenue Service for income tax purposes. And this was signed, notarized, and sworn to at the time. Uh, to the affidavit, I would add only that the name I recorded the Chinese grocery store was mistaken. Since revisiting the site, I have determined the name of the store was Tuk Chong. Okay. Um, also, in March 74, I provided the Rockefeller Commission with 17 different photographs of myself taken between the time period of 1961 and 1964. It's my understanding these photographs were compared with those of the so-called tramps by FBI photo analyst Lindahl Shamiefelt, who determined with professional finality that the Trump voters were not of Frank Sturgis or myself. Yeah, and that seems to be the agreement from all of these files as well, that all of the official reviews of the photographs of the originals showed yeah. that it was neither Hunt nor Sturgis in a copy way clearer than anything available on the Internet. Yep, and he goes on to further say that... It Early in 75, Dick Gregory was given a series of photographs of the tramps together with several of Frank Sturgis and myself. In press conferences and talk shows, Gregory professed to see unmistakable similarity between the tramp photos and those of Sturgis and Hunt and pressed the photographs upon the Rockefeller Commission with demands for satisfaction. Shortly thereafter, in a timing sequence not entirely coincidental, a book by Alan Weberman and Michael Canfield was published Coup d'etat in America, which relied heavily on a presumptive likeness of Sturgis and myself to the so-called Dallas Tramps. The, the defamatory intent of the book was so clear that I sued the authors and the publisher of the book for libel. The publishing company went out of business and the publisher returned to his native Nigeria. Litigation against the two authors is active to this day. That these smears have staying power was reflected during a series of lectures I gave to college students last year. Invariably, some questioner would avert to my supposed involvement in the assassination of President Kennedy on the assumption that I had occult knowledge of the tragedy. And he goes on to talk about um, magazine articles and newspapers. He even, he even mentions a spotlight. Um, and this is as early as 1978. Mm -hmm. Almost 1979. So there is the story directly from Howard Hunt's mouth. And like I said, I think we can, I think it'd be safe to assume Carmine that maybe both of these things did take place, that he had that meeting in the morning. And of course, you know, when he picks up his kids from school and then, then everybody finally gets home and they're get around the television and just like everybody else, they watched everything unfold. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, th I think that that's highly reasonable too. You know, I mean, as we said earlier, you know, there could have been, there was deception on his part, no matter how he wants to, you know, state it, but it wasn't deception to hide any connection to the Kennedy assassination. He wasn't going to publicly declare that he had had a meeting with two of the high ranking CIA members and an exile earlier in the day before he went to the Chinese grocery store with his wife. Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> all right. I think that's it, man. Did we get to everything? Yeah. I think we covered all the files and, you know, I understand this is going to upset some people, but people are going to have to start to understand that we're not going to make any advancement in these cases. We're not going to make any progress in the JFK case unless we're willing to take new evidence, incorporate it into our ideas, and then move from there. 
You know, it's it it shouldn't be pro. You always see these lines drawn about you know pro or anti conspiracy. It should just be pro and anti evidence, in my opinion. You know, yeah. we need to we need to start taking the credible evidence and using that to form our ideas. Yeah, you know, recently somebody accused me of being a conspiracy theorist, and I said, "Well, I wouldn't wouldn't really call myself a conspiracy theorist; more a truth seeker." You know, I go where the truth lies, whether it be with, aligned with what I believe or not. I just want to know the truth, mm-hmm. and that's what everybody should want to know: is the truth. And it's usually going to be a mixture, you know? It's not black or white. It's going to be shades of gray where all the evidence that will really make some definitive progress lies. It's not going to agree with anyone's agenda. You know, it's going to have – the evidence has its own agenda. <laughs> That's right. And and did you want to tell people uh, anything about your book coming up? Uh, sure. Yeah, uh, Two Princes and a King. Uh, it's tpak.com, T-P-A-A-K.com. Uh, you can also find myself, Rob, and Chuck O'Chelli's O'Chelli Effect on Neapolis Media Group. Uh, there's a link on Rob's uh, T. Ah, sorry, the Lone Government Podcast <laughs> website. I almost said the letters wrong. Um, I do too. Also, uh, I'll be putting up uh, the book will be coming out later in January. At the end of January, my book will be coming out. I'll be putting up the date soon and to be announcing pre sale. So please go and check it out. And uh, I hope you enjoy it if you decide to pick up a copy. Yep, and I would urge everybody to, st- to stay tuned to uh, Neapolis Media Group on Twitter. Uh, just search for them there, and you'll be the first to know when you can order for pre-sale and, the re- and for the release date as well. And that's uh, at Neapolis MG, capital MG. Easy as that, people. Carmine, thank you so much for stopping by and helping me debunk. Oh, it was a, a couple, pleasure. A Always couple good more, folks. to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, always is, my friend. Trying to cross names off the list so we can get to some good ones. <laughs> you got that right. All right, people. This son of a bitch is in the can. Beam up the satellite down directly to your ears. This is your boy. Peace. I awake to find no peace of mind I said, how do you live As a fugitive Down here where I cannot see so clear I said, what do I know Show me the right way to go And the spies came out So bad, cause you know and the spies hide out in every corner But you can't touch them, no Touch them, no.